So the integral test, we need to have uh, a series and the terms need to be non-negative. So if you, if you use the word positive, that means not zero and greater than zero. So non-negative means not negative, so it allows for zero. So a series of non-negative terms. So that means a n is greater than or equal to zero for all n. Negative terms converges if the partial sums are bounded from above. Above. Why don't I need, in this situation, why don't I need to worry about the partial sums going towards negative infinity? So why don't I need to say explicitly they're bounded from below? Because it's greater than or equal to zero. Yeah, so it's greater than or equal to zero. So you don't need to write this down, but this would be bounded below by zero. There's no way I'm going to get any negative out of this. So the smallest number I could get is where every term is zero, and that would be bounded below by zero. So in this case, uh, we don't have to worry about the bounded from below part. All right. Now, <coughs> when I just when I say the partial sums are bounded from below, that means all the partial sums bounded from above. That means all the partial sums are bounded from above. So in the limit, it would also be less than um, whatever that bound is. So if you can show that the partial sums are bounded from above, you can say the series uh, converges. Um, what we're going to do is look at the integral test. So of course, adding up all these values is really similar to integrating a function that has similar values. So if we have a non-negative series, so we'll begin, we'll write out our series So if a k greater than zero for all k. And that upside down a means all. So if a k greater than zero for all k. So when I say all k, if k starts at negative 400, that means from negative 400 all the way to infinity. Every term is uh, zero or more. So I'm just going to be a little bit lazy and just write all k. So all the k's that are relevant for the series. Uh, all k. And so if your terms are not negative and there exists a continuous f of x such that f of k equals a k for all k, so that means at all the integer values that you're using, if your function has the same value as your terms. Uh, you also need f to be decreasing. So of course that means f prime will be less than or equal to zero, not necessarily for all x's, but all x's from whatever your starting value is to infinity. So I'm just going to write all x. You'll usually be able to tell if your function is decreasing or not when you look at it. All right, so that, this is our hypothesis. There are three things you need. You need positive terms. You need a continuous function that uh, is equal to the terms at the integers, and you need this function to be decreasing. So if you got all these three properties, then, so our conclusion, uh, 
then the summation a k and the integral I'm gonna need to use a value here so we'll say k starts at I don't want to put a number we'll use n0 as our minimum So the sum and the area under the curve behave the same. So I'm not saying that they're equal, but if one of them converges, then the other one converges. If one of them diverges, the other one diverges. So that's what I mean by behave the same. So either both converge or both diverge. So we can turn a problem about summation, a series, into a problem about an integral. We could go the other direction if we want to, but the integral test is generally used to go from a series to an integral. You could go the opposite way, but you usually, uh, at least in this class, we won't do that, go the other direction. So what we're going to do is um, prove convergence and divergence of two different series. So find convergence or divergence of, and we'll have two problems here. The first one, summation. I think we did these before. Although I don't think we use the integral test. them again if we did them before. All right, convergence or divergence. <clears throat> so what I need is, first of all, are all the terms going to be zero or more? Any way to get negative terms starting at when k is 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all going to be positive. If I started k at negative 10, that'd be a different story. So we have positive terms, so I need a function. So I need an f of x function that's continuous and equals 1 over k. So what function should we use? You probably need one brain cell to do this. 1 over x. So what is f of k? 1 over k. As long as k is not 0, this will be fine. And of course, we're starting at 1. So going to write this is for all k. So our function equals our uh, a n right there, That's a, or a k. So we got f k equals a k, so the values are correct. Uh, is our function decreasing? When x getting bigger, is our function getting smaller? Yes. So I don't necessarily need to take a derivative. I could if I wanted to. I think it would be if I did f prime of x negative 1 over x squared, and of course that's decreasing for all x values. Well, except when x is 0, but certainly from 1 to infinity. So generally, I won't require you to write that step down. So this converges if the integral from 1 to infinity converges. So we're going to check 1 to infinity. Oh, maybe I remember doing this from back in when we did 8.7 improper integrals. So this is the main reason we did improper integrals. And so we can come up here and do the integral test. So go ahead and integrate this. And this does not use anti-power rule, which you should figure out really quickly because you'd be divided by 0 if you tried it. 
So step one, you need lim b approaching infinity, one to b. So when you get down to ln of infinity, you need to have that either in a cheat sheet or just know that that is infinity, one of the two. So ln of infinity is infinity. We did a geometric proof of that before. So that's not necessarily super intuitive, but it's a fact that you need to know. All right, so this area is infinity. So that is a divergent. Remember when we looked at infinite uh, or improper integrals, there was a good chance that it could diverge. And it diverged if you either got infinity, negative infinity, or somehow not uh, a numerical value. So in this case, uh, divergent. So our integral diverges uh, thus by the uh, integral test. Summation one over k, also diverges. And I could rewrite this as k to the negative one. Example two, so we took care of the uh, p equals one case already. That was the one we just looked at right up here. So if p equals one, I could write a first power, but it's always dangerous in a calculus class to write a first power but we took care of if p equals 1 right there. So let's assume p is not 1. So that means either p is bigger than 1 or p is smaller than 1. Yeah, so p is a constant. Just looking at this, so the, the non-constant is k. k is going to be the, uh, the term that's going to change. So there's two cases. I'll do that on the right, or on the left, and we'll do the p greater than 1 on the right. <clears throat> all right, so it's pretty clear all terms will be positive on this right here. We're not using any negative k's, so all terms are positive. So what function should we use? Too many brain cells are working. What function should we use? One over x to the p. One over x to the p. It should be pretty clear. That should be the easiest part of the problem, is writing down f of x. And depending on what you're doing, it might be better to go x to the negative p, depending on uh, how you want to do your calculus. All right, so we've got a function. It is uh, always going to be greater than or equal to 0, it's not going to be negative, and it'll have the right value. 
Now it is true for there are certain values of p. It looks like if p is less than zero, this function is actually increasing. However, that will all come out in the wash because if you integrate it, you'll get infinity anyways. Uh, so go ahead and integrate from one to infinity, x negative p dx, and same thing. So the reason we took care of the special case before, that's the only one that turns into natural log. So in, this, in either of these cases, you just use the anti-power rule. Uh, but then you will have to use the fact that p is a certain value right here. So go ahead and find the antiderivative and use limit notation and do your best to see what happens. I would probably just, just do the left one all the way first. I'm kind of doing two problems at the same time. Just work on the left side. Try to finish that. Just do the uh, p less than 1 case right now. So that's just a number. So that won't okay. affect convergence divergence. We got to think about that guy. So what happens right there?
So in the blue, I just wrote down some relatively easy algebra, except you have to be a little careful. If you make P negative, multiply by negative one, your inequality turns around. In fact, man runs from the ghost. So what in the world is this limit? So we've got a number that's getting bigger. This base is getting bigger and bigger. But the power it's raised to is positive. So what happens? You have a number getting really big raised to a positive power. What's that? The, yeah, this is the left side. So we're doing the p less than 1 right now. So I, I just took the p less than 1 right here, and then I basically solved for negative p plus 1. I could have uh, subtracted p and then subtracted 1. That's another way to get them to change sides. But I just multiply by negative 1 instead. All right, so you got a big number raised to a positive power. So if I just use the number alpha, alpha is greater than 0. What's infinity raised to a positive power? Now, the one thing you have to keep in mind, this power is not approaching 0. This power is constant. So this is not a case of uh, indeterminate limit or indeterminate form. So our power is not approaching 0. Our power is con some constant number. It might be small. It might be a half or a tenth. But even a tenth root of infinity is still infinity. Uh, this is just another number. Multiplied right there, p is not. We eliminate the case where p is 1. So that's just a number. And then whatever uh, you get here is just minus 1. So that minus 1 won't affect it either. So this is going to be infinity to a positive power. Um, would b be negative? Uh, nope. It was a very positive. So it's going to be, you know, you could think of like a trillion billion, some big number, getting bigger. It's just when you took the 1 over 1 minus p out from under the b, where did the negative go? Um, I just changed the order I wrote it, basically. You can, oh, okay. I just don't like to have ne like my leading term negative if I can help it. For, it's just a personal preference. It looks ugly. Also, that negative might migrate close to my infinity or something like that. So I, I try not to have leading negatives, if possible. Another way to fix that is just group it up. All right, so we got infinity, divergent. All right, play the same game over on the right side. A lot of the work you've already done. So you just need to uh, start out, instead of p less than 1, you're now starting out with p greater than 1. So go ahead and solve for negative p plus 1 and see what you get. So we have a number getting bigger raised to a negative power. So what is that? Infinity raised to a negative power. Zero. It would be zero. So it's basically one over a larger and larger number. So that's going to be zero minus, well, I forgot my constant. So 
So we just get a number here. So this converges. All right, so we get divergent when p is less than 1, and convergent when p is greater than 1. So let's summarize everything. We got two results here, and our p equals 1 result from above. So we had, let's see, 1 over k to the p. It could start anywhere as long as you're not going to um, use zero. So I'll just leave the bottom part blank. So this is going to converge sometimes and diverge sometimes. So we said it converges when p is greater than 1. And we got diverge if p is less than 1 and if p equals 1. So we'll put them both together and p is less than 1 or equal to 1, so less than or equal to 1. So this is what we call a p-series. Sort of a lame name. P is an arbitrary choice, but that's what the name of the series is. This will be more useful than it may appear. So I recommend this gets on your cheat sheet. You're going to compare other series back to this series relatively frequently. So it's going to be a very nice uh, reference series. So you can apply integral tests to other series as well. I'm just going to stop on these. Basically, this one example right here. Integral series works exactly the way it looks. Okay. So I'm going to do one more, talk about one more thing. All right, so this diverges and it's positive. Each term is positive, so it obviously diverges to positive infinity. So even though that this is positive infinity, how big do you think you need to, how many terms do you think you need to go to to get bigger than 20? So the first term's one, the next term's a half, then a third, then a fourth. So you've got to go for a little while before you even hit two. 
making about three, you have to go quite a bit further because your terms keep getting smaller. So in order to actually hit 20, you need to go past 178 million. And you can use an integral to see you know, how far would I have to integrate the one over x function to hit 20. So I'm going to stop the recording here, and then we'll start up again, just in case the battery runs out. I don't want to lose this part.